Hi everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rich Shackleton. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and as well as my day job, I also co-chair uh, Global Spectrum, which is our uh, LGBT plus employee resource group. I just want to say a really warm welcome to everybody who's here this afternoon. Um, it's great to see members of the Pearson LGBT plus community um, alongside colleague allies, customers, as well as partners and stakeholders here today. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm so delighted to be welcoming Mark and his husband Jason uh, to our Pearson officers. We are the world's leading learning company and so getting to hear from Mark gives us the opportunity to learn firsthand about his experiences and his great work over the years. Of course today wouldn't be possible without a number of people so I just wanted to say a few thank yous if I may. Uh, firstly to Sarah and to Shay um, and the Medway Pride radio team without whom um, we simply wouldn't have Mark here today. Um, next to Lisa Egan in our procurement team for actually f getting Mark across the Atlantic. Um, to Sam Hone and Rebecca Price in the marketing team for um, not only helping us promote everything about this event but also always being there creating amazing student content and really making sure that students are seen and feel included and visible in our content. Um, to Ned Coombs and the team for filming today so that we can make the event available to people all around the world and to our facilities team for helping make this, um, this a reality. So thank you to um, Fabio and Fabiola. Um, and finally, my thanks to Mark for giving your time, sharing your experiences. We wanted to present you with a token gift. Um, we know you received a gift yesterday, but we wanted to present you with another token gift. Um, and that is something that um, the um, British Royal Mint have done to celebrate 50 years of pride. I don't know if you've had one already. Um, so they've produced a 50p coin, uh, which is specifically marks 50 years of pride in the UK. It's got the progress flag on it. Oh, it's, it's beautiful! <laughs> um, it is left sealed for a reason. Excuse me for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, get a photo of that. That's okay. wonderful. <laughs> It is left sealed for a reason, and that is because it adds to the value. But if you do want to open it, then it folds out, and you can read all about the, uh, about the story behind putting it together. Well, I don't want to take, it, take everyone's time, but I will read it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll just hand over to Shay now, because I know, Shay, you want to um, present a picture as well. Hi, I'm Shay Coffey. My pronouns are she, her. I am manager and co-founder of Medway Pride Radio, and it is an absolute honour to be here today. Um, yes, no surprise, because you both saw this last night. Um, but this is what we had commissioned for Mark as a thank you. When Mark and I talked about this visit, you only had one stipulation, if you remember, and that was you wanted a crisp £50 note. Well, we went one better than that. That's a spend. <laughs> We went one better than that and had it redesigned uh, by a colourblind artist local to Medway. Um, and this is the finished product. I just, if you could start before we get into everything by explaining exactly why you wanted the fifty pound note. I think of my life. By the way, I, I just want to start. But am I on? I'm using that. Go, one. Go, go for it. Um, it's great being in a room full of pioneers. You might not think of yourself as pioneers, but every part of the LGBT plus community has been pioneering something new as we go along. Um, we've only been doing what we're doing since about 1895. I know that might surprise you. Um, with an organization uh, called the Scientific Humanitarians Committee and a man by the name of Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld in Berlin. It's when we first started to organize for equality. And He's one of my heroes, uh, and when people ask me who a hero is, I seem to search. Oscar Wilde is one because he brought the needle a little forward. Um, and of recent years, this gentleman has become a hero um, because we as a people don't have pride in our own history and what we contributed to society. Um, here's a man who not only saved hundreds of thousands of lives during the Second World War, here's a man who also pioneered the idea of computing. 
that's pretty awesome. Um, so he's become a hero of mine. Um, and when I heard that they were doing a bill, that meant something to me because uh, that's value. They're putting value on us. And I'm a person that didn't feel when I was coming out that I had a, any value because society told me I didn't belong anywhere in its spectrum. So that's why it's important to me. So thank you. Thank you both. You're very welcome. Lovely. And I leave here with 100 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> 50 pounds and 50 pence. Oh, pence. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask for the makeup of that. <laughs> so Mark, why don't you tell us about you? OK. Um, I think my life is similar to people of my generation. Uh, uh, growing up in, in my city of Philadelphia, which is just like every other city in America, uh, at one time or another, for me, it was pretty early in life, I realized that I was different. Um, while my friends were all Googling uh, the girl down the block, I sort of in my mind was Googling the guy down the block. And so I began to wonder, why couldn't I express that? There was something inside me that said, I can't tell anyone that. I can't tell any of my friends. I can't tell my parents. I have to keep that inside of me. And that, of course, brought all types of emotional feelings. Uh, if I wanted to learn who I was, um, I couldn't turn on TV because it was prohibited from having a gay person or discussion about people like me on TV. There were no newspaper articles about people like me, nor magazines, nor radio. It was illegal. People like me were not allowed to congregate anywhere. So I thought, in a city of one million people, I thought I was the only one like me. So I felt lonely, to say the least, and wanted to escape. I found out that there was this place where bohemians and hippies hung out in New York City called Greenwich Village. And I thought, well, if that place has uh, strange people, they got to have strange people like me. Um, so when I was 18, literally a month before I graduated high school, May 10th, 1969, uh, I went to New York. Uh, I had told my parents, my loving parents, uh, that I was going to school. I literally had no plans for anything. I didn't know where I was going to live. I didn't know where I was going to work. I had zero plans. My only hope was to meet people like me. Uh, so I go to New York. I check in at the YMCA, which the B, uh, BBC now tells me meant that I was homeless. Uh, and I, first evening there, I took the tube or subway and went down to Greenwich Village and started looking. In those days, there was no neon si sign saying, this way to the gay people. <laughs> uh, and I stumbled across Christopher Street. Nirvana, my people. I just looked, and there were people that I knew were like me. Uh, and so at 18 years old, that became my hangout. Every single night from maybe 5 or 6 p.m. until 2, 3, 4 in the morning. I was on Christopher Street. That meant walking up and down Christopher Street, meeting with my friends, just talking, and, and you, you know, uh, having fun, as 18-year-olds do. But what do 18-year-olds like to do? We like to dance. <laughs> and guess what? There was only one place in New York in June of 1969 to dance. And that was a place called the Stonewall. And it was a dive. It was owned by the mafia. And it was illegal. But for us, we didn't think of all those things. What we thought about was, you can go in there. You could hold your, your friend's hand. You could kiss. You could cuddle. And you could dance. Um, and so we loved it. And every night, usually around 11, 12, or 1 in the morning, we headed to the Stonewall. And if you got in, because they had limits. This is something people don't talk about. People like Shay, they might have had a limit. Oh, we got 12 of them already in here. We're not going to have any more. 
and their whole business was based on selling water down drinks um, and having enough cute guys in there so the older people with money might be able to pick them up. Uh, I was one of the cute ones, by the way. <laughs> Um, I was 18 at the time, do the math, I'm now 71. Uh, so on uh, June 27th, uh, I was in the bar. I'd been in New York only six weeks. I was hanging out the back of the bar and the lights flickered on and off. Uh, I asked the person next to me, what's going on? And they said, casually, oh, just another raid. Because they were used to raids. I had never been in anything like that in my life before. Uh, but this raid was different than what they were used to. What they were used to was the police coming in, taking a few bucks out of the cash register and leaving. Just allowing them to make more money so they could do it another week later. That's what they were interested in. But this time was different. This time they didn't knock or ring the bell. This time they burst through the doors. This time when they came in they started smashing things. This time when they came in, they took us and slammed us up against the wall. This time when they came in, uh, they took money from some of the older people. Uh, in my thought, my mind is, my God, someone has to call the police. Then I realized these were the police who were doing this. We had no safeguard in society. So the first thing that happened, as I recall it, was once they had done all the damage that they felt they were comfortable doing, once they felt that they had intimidated everybody they were going to intimidate, they started letting people out of the bar. Um, the, the first ones to be let out of the bar were the ones they had no use for. I was a street kid. They had absolutely no use for me. Um, so I was one of the earlier ones to be carted. I got out and I walked across the street because I wasn't quite sure what had just happened um, and wanted to know more. Uh, so I just stood there and as other people came out, those people who were what we would say today were white and privileged, had a job or family in the area, uh, they just ran away as quickly as they could. Uh, those people who were people of color and trans and who were used to being harassed at one time or another in their lives stood around. Um, street kids, trans, uh, people of color, um, and a lot of people like me um, who didn't know what was going on. Uh, eventually police had done everything they could inside the bar and inside the bar were the few police people and the patrons of the bar. I'm sorry, the workers of the bar. Uh, and the police said, figured, okay, we'll leave. They opened the door uh, and a few of us threw things at them. First myth, there was no brick thrown at Stonewall. There were no bricks in the area. Nothing was being built. We've actually gone back and looked to see what the building records of New York were. Um, so what was being thrown? Uh, coins, anything in our pockets, uh, a empty soda can that was on the ground, whatever. Um, do you know who threw the first item? No. Um, it was spontaneous. It was a riot. Uh, so first time they tried to get out, things were thrown at them. Second time, uh, people started yelling things. Third time uh, that they lo looked out the, the door, they looked and quickly closed it because more things were being thrown at them. Uh, so somewhere in my mind, what my thought was at that moment was, isn't this interesting? These are the people we've always been afraid of incarcerating us. And now we have incarcerated the police. Never done before. Then, of course, all of a sudden, uh, I'm thinking, hmm, that's an interesting thought. And, and I know this was a split second, and I can't tell you exactly what the words were, but my mind is, this is 1969. It's the height of the cultural re revolution in the United States of America. Women are fighting for their rights. Blacks are for fighting for their rights. Latinos are fight fighting for their rights. What about us? What about us? And I swore right then and there, that's what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I didn't have a job, I didn't have a place to live, but somehow I knew I was going to do that. No one in the United States was literally being paid to do that. No one. Um, so at that point, um, 
who I guess would be my role model of what an activist would become or would be or was, uh, was a man by the name of Marty Robinson. Came up to me with a piece of chalk. Uh, I have no idea where he got the chalk. Uh, and said, uh, go up and down Christopher Street and write on the streets and on the walls tomorrow night Stonewall. And that's what I'm known to do. Now, the logic of doing that tells you lots of things about Stonewall and should break the myth. So notice I'm going up and down from Christopher Street, which is on 6th Avenue, about four blocks down to the docks, writing on the street and on the walls. So I didn't see everything. So anybody who says they saw anything wasn't there. Now, I in my time in the United States, and probably some of you here have had someone come up to you and say, I was at Stonewall. Um, I would never contradict that because they might have been on a corner somewhere watching everything that was going on. Technically, they were at Stonewall. Um, they might have been passing by, as my friend Martha Shelley was doing. Um, but everything, no one did everything, no one saw everything. Um, but in the years since then, uh, we have all learned various aspects. So who was there and continued the work of Stonewall? Well, the next night, Marty Robinson and Martha Shelley spoke from the very steps of that battered Stonewall. That was night number two. Night number three and almost every other night after Stonewall, we were on the streets passing out leaflets. Those leaflets could have said, okay, we're doing a march against the police. Okay, we're doing a social dance. Okay, here's a legal alert for you. Here's a medical alert for you. Oh, we're organizing. And that organization became, from the ashes of Stonewall, Gay Liberation Front. Gay Liberation Front probably was, to this very day, the most dysfunctional organization that has ever existed. Um, but that dysfunctionality was magic. Um, we were totally disorganized of every way, shape, or form. You walked into the meeting, um, and we threw up a stick. Whoever caught the stick chaired the meeting. We had no officers, no standing committees in reality, um, no officers, no standing treasury. Um, but we did two magical things that first year. The first thing we did was we realized we were under attack. So therefore, everything, even that meeting, was illegal. So it was illegal to congregate. So therefore, we decided we had to change that. And how do you change that? Well, we're united here. How were we united under that kind of pressure? Well, over that corner, you had the fairy, gay men fairies. Over that corner, you had the lesbian separatists. People who normally would not be in the same room together. Then you had the young 20-year-old hippie types. Then you had street kids like me. We were all united because we knew we were under attack. And we knew to fight that oppression, we had to do things that were never done before. But we had one thing important to do first more than anything else. We had to recognize who we were as individuals. And I could tell you about all the debates and arguments that went on in that room. And they went on to, to 12, 1, 2 in the morning sometimes. But they all had to do with one, two words very simple. Self-identity and learning to respect each and every one of us in that room with self-identity. And then, second thing we learned, creating community where there had been none before. There was no LGBT community. There was no one doing services to us. None. Health services? Zero. Legal services? Zero. We had to put all of that together. So in that first year, we created the first gay youth organization to deal with suicide and battering and bullying. We created the first trans organization. That organization was called Street Transvestite um, Action Revolutionary, STAR. And STAR was created by two people who have become infamous by this point, my sisters, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. And we'll, I'm sure, get into all of the myths about them as we go, go along here today. Uh, but they, 
they created an organization that was to help trans people. At that time, they were basically transvestites, transsexuals, or drag queens. Today, that is part of the trans family. Um, but they revolutionized that. Now, here's a myth that Peter and I the other day. Uh, Peter, do you want to wave, please? Uh, your national hero, Peter, back there, um, who I had the honor of meeting yesterday, um, and has done all of these things I'm talking about now here in this country. Uh, once we learned what uh, to accept each other uh, for, for our various identities, it was fighting all of that equally. And it seems today that society has broken down and you're going to have the trans people in this corner, you're going to have the lesbians in that corner, you're going to have the gay people in that corner, you're going to have the gay people who are trans and lesbian over in that corner, and, and, and broken down into so many ways. Um, I think we need to look back at time and realize there's a time when we need to unite. Um, I know in my country, and I think in yours, we're under incredible attack right now. You can't do that separately. We need to unite like we did back then. Once again, we need to be a force. So that's one message I hope to bring to you today. So as we went along, my lesson was, um, the other lesson was, okay, so we're legally connected. We have a legal com committee, or what, what would be today called a committee. Uh, so when we discovered that people were being blackmailed, they put out uh, leaflets, which we would leaflet every night up and down Christopher Street. Um, here's someone for you to contact. Here's a lawyer that will actually help you, will go to court with you and represent a gay person. That was just unusual. Okay, you have a medical alert. Um, you think your um, gender is wrong. Here are doctors you could go to that will treat you humanely. Um, we had a youth committee. Do you feel you're going to um, uh, uh, be bullied if you go to school and let people know you're gay? Or are you a feminine? Or are you too masculine? These are what you could do. Or do you feel like you just don't want to live anymore? Here's someone you could call. Um, uh, come to our meetings. We did that every day. We began to build a community. If all of that were not enough, we decided we need to be out loud and proud. And not just inside our own community, but also let the world know who we were. So we put, wanted to put an ad in a newspaper called The Village Voice. And we went to them, they said, we can't print that ad. Why can't you print that ad? It says homosexuals are meeting. That's illegal. Well, we marched on uh, the Village Voice and got them to print that ad. Um, the police made the mistake of raiding another of our bars while we were organizing. Well, we circled the police station. And that, by the way, is when I got my first arrest. I am so proud of being arrested. Uh, uh, by the way, Peter has more arrests than I do. We discussed that yesterday. <laughs> Um, uh, I got arrested uh, for disorderly conduct, means I was demonstrating against the police themselves. Uh, so uh, not liking us very much, uh, they took me and they put these handcuffs on me and uh, handcuffed me to a heating pipe. Uh, the, uh, I was let out with a summons to appear in court. Uh, that cost $125 which was a lot of money in those days, which I didn't have. Um, a fellow member of Gay Liberation Front, John Knoebel, paid the money. I did not know this. Uh, this whole story was lost to me. But when I was going through my papers, I found that receipt. I still have it. Um, and I asked my fellow Gay Liberation Front, does anyone know about this? What was this? And John told me um, about it. Uh, that receipt today, uh, that little action, um, we have a museum in the United States of America called the Smithsonian. Uh, by the way, it's our uh, National History Museum. Uh, they came to me a few years ago and asked me for my artifacts over the last 53 years. And that's one of the items they got to put up in a wall in that museum to show. But what I learned from all of those action was, um, and the lesson of my life, is visibility. Visibility is the most important thing. And I didn't think we were going far enough. So in order to go far enough, you had to reach the general public with what I believe were stunts. 
um, or uh, actions, or zaps as we called them in that day. And so the first one I did was, uh, I figured we, I'd go to a dance show, a teenage dance show that was being broadcast by a local uh, TV station. Um, we called it American Bandstand in those days. And I went with my friend Saj Pal, who happens to be black. Um, and we danced, and as soon as we started dancing, the person who was the MC of the show said, quote, get those faggots off that floor and throw them out. And we were kindly showed the door. On the way home, Saj and I had an argument. He argued that the reason uh, we were thrown off the floor was that we were an interracial couple. I argued that the re reason we were thrown off was because we were a same-sex couple, um, which was we both knew the reality. But that gave us the uh, thing we needed to do a further action, which was a few nights later, uh, on the 11.30 news on that TV station, we barged in onto the live broadcast and interrupted it. We were arrested. The only damage we created was that the sports announcer got his makeup on my jacket. Uh, but we were arrested, uh, and I didn't know what that would create. But the following morning when I was let out of jail and saw the morning newspapers, it was the entire front page of every newspaper in town. Every news talk show was talking about it. And I realized, hmm. Here's a media that wouldn't talk about us, and all of a sudden, the millions of people living in Philadelphia are reading about us or are listening to about us on the radio. What a great opportunity is for them to get to know us. Um, so I decided to take that on a national level, and the national level meant that I had to do a disruption of a national TV show. Uh, so we went to New York, and. Uh, we discovered that there was a daytime show similar to all the morning chat shows you have in the United States. At that time, it was called The Today Show. It was on the NBC television network, which was in a building called 30 Rock, which is somewhat famous Rockefeller Center in New York. Uh, and luckily, they were so proud of their buildings that they gave tours of the building. So uh, we went on the last tour of the night, uh, which was about 8 o'clock. And uh, as the tour was winding up, we sort of hung back and we found a closet to hide in that night. Um, and at six in the morning, we left the closet, found the studio, and as they were broadcasting, we did the same thing. We walked onto the set um, and said, gays protest, blah, 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 blah. And the announcer got up and looked like he was climbing the walls. Um, and the videotape of this still exists. Um, and they, uh, a bunch of stagehand came, grabbed us, took us into the hall, um, at which time a woman came out and she said, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? And a, a, a man then came out and said to her, get in, you're on the air. Um, on to us because we were in the hall. She went on the air. Her name was Barbara Walters, and she happens to be the first TV reporter that had nationally ever reported on a gay action on American national television. Might have been 6.30 in the morning, and maybe not a lot of people didn't see it, but um, it, of course, realized, I realized that something from here needs to be done. So what it meant was, let's do some research. And what is the largest live show in America where more people are watching and blah, 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 blah. Well, we came across the idea of the CBS Evening News, which was broadcast at that time by a man by the name of Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite was the most trusted man in America. He is the reason that a president during the Vietnam War, Lyndon Baines Johnson, did not run for re-election. As he said in his memoir, if Walter Cronkite is not behind you, America is not behind you. And he had a whopping rating of 60 million people a night, which is about a third of America. Um, today, you don't get a rating for that unless you're watching the Super Bowl or something of that sort. Um, so uh, we uh, sent the, his producers a letter saying that we were students studying TV and we would love to come into the studio and do a report on how they produ produce the news. Uh, and as they were uh, doing the news livecast, 
Um, they came back from a commercial and Walter was sitting at his desk and the camera was right in his face. Um, and at that point, I slipped between the camera and sat on Walter's face with my back to Walter and looked in the camera with a sign which read, Gays Protest CBS Prejudice. Uh, at which point, uh, a bunch of people came rushing at me, charged me, grappled me to the floor, wrapped me in cables, and there was about seven minutes of black airspace on the CBS television network. Um, I was ushered to be arrested, not before CBS could personally interview me because they could get the exclusive yeah. of why this crazy person did this. Um, but they took me off to jail. Um, and Walter came back and said, well, some major activity here in the CBS studio. We were just raided by people who said they were homosexuals. That was amazing. And again, every newspaper in America picked that story up. And I was sort of a villain because I'd attacked the most trusted man in America, Walter Cronkite. But another strange thing happened. I was invited on every national American television show to talk about why I did that and who I was as an individual and what it meant to be homosexual. And of course, the first thing I did say to them was, um, I'm not a homosexual, I'm gay. That's your term for me. I self-identify as gay. And why do I do that? Because homosexual is a scientific term, and here's what you uh, label that. Um, you don't realize I have a full life, that I want all the same things that you want. That's who I am. That's, who, that's where I am. So I moved on from that and realized, okay, there are a lot of other people here. So before Stonewall, and this sort of surprises people, there were only 100 out people in all of the United States. By the time in 1973, when... Those hundred people, the way you could figure that out very quickly is there are only about 10 organizations that exist in the United States. Um, so for men, there was Mattachine Society. For women, there was Daughters of Belitis. There was the East Coast, something or other. And there was also Homophile Action League. All of them had about, maybe if you were lucky, uh, 10 people who would literally be willing to be interviewed as openly gay or homosexual people. Um, and they were only in the top 10 major cities in America equals 100, but a better way to do it is from 1965 to 1969, there was one, one demonstration for gay rights in America, and that was in Philadelphia, the city I grew up in, 65 to 69. I was still living there, and guess what? I didn't know about those demonstrations because media wouldn't cover them. And again, I thought I was the only one. I didn't know that there were national movement. This is the premier demonstration. 40 to 100 people. That was it. So after Stonewall, after doing all those things all that first year, organizing gay youth, organizing trans, organizing sexuality, learning to talk about what is masculinity, what is femininity, fighting the police, fighting media, if all that were not what, done in one year, we created the first gay pride. Christopher Street Liberation Day. So what was it? We were going to march out of the village, which, which was our neighborhood, our ghetto, the place we felt safe. We were going to walk all the way across the city up to Central Park to say, we are out loud, and guess what, folks? We're proud. We're proud of who we are. We're proud of trying to create a community. We're proud of who we are as individuals. We're proud of who we love. And guess what? You'll get used to it. We didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, we didn't know how many people were to show up. Remember, only 100 people up to that point. We had a few demonstrations within that year, um, but we didn't realize that we had reached anybody. We really didn't know. Um, and we expected a few hundred people to show up. We also didn't know if we were going to be attacked. So we had civil disobedience courses at a place called Alternate U. There were, to my memory, about 10 of us who were marshals. Um, and we took civil disobedience course, courses in order to be marshals to protect the crowd if we were attacked. Um, so the day we started gathering at 7th Avenue and Christopher Street, which is right across the street from Stonewall, um, uh, crowd got big. we were going to march off, I think, at 12 or 1 o'clock. 
Um, but people, we showed up at 10 a.m. in the morning, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And <clears throat> so by the time we started marching out of uh, the village and on to 6th Avenue, oh, during this period of time, the police said they would not give us a permit. We said, we don't care. You'll give us a permit or not. We're marching. So unlike your first gay pride, as, as Peter tells me, uh, you had more police, it seems, uh, than LGBT people. The police also did, didn't believe that we would have the nerve to leave our area and do this. So we didn't have that many police. They also finally gave in and gave us a permit, but for two lanes of a six-lane avenue. Uh, so as we're walking out, we sort of realized that we were larger than just two lanes, and we decided, oh, screw this. We took over the, all six lanes. Um, and we got, so uh, where Christopher Street comes out onto uh, the avenue is about 7th Street, 8th uh, Street. Um, so when we got to 17th Street, uh, I climbed the pole, something I could not do today, by the way, um, and looked back. And as far as I could see up to Christopher Street, people were still coming out. That sent chills down my back of happiness that I don't think, I'm getting them right now again, um, but I don't think I'll ever have that again. Um, I realized we had created something, um, which, which uh, I was sort of amazed uh, at at that time. Um, the interesting thing is, no one stopped us, no one harassed us. We didn't, I didn't even hear anyone call us anything all the way up to 57th Street. Um, my thought today is, um, they were more scared of us than we were scared of them. Um, because they thought, yeah. how incredible of them that they're you know, doing this, or how silly, or how foolish. That was 1970. I started doing my media zaps in 1973. And people asked me, well, what did that do? Well, it brought out a whole bunch of new activists. Uh, I didn't have to do all those talk shows because there were a lot of other people who wanted to do them, and that was great. I mean, I got to concentrate and do what I now call my experiment in my own home city of Philadelphia, um, which, by the way, uh, many people believe is the most gay-friendly city in America, and I believe it was because of visibility that there were so many of us out and did the work in that city. Um, but what did that mean for me? What that meant was creating community. Uh, and creating community means you take care of those in your community who have the most needs. And the first need, in my thoughts, were youth, because they're just coming to terms with who they are. Um, and realizing that, gee, they might, uh, might not have support from their family, might not have support from their coworkers or their fellow students. Um, and they might have to hide that. Now, for those of you who are LGBT uh, plus in this room, uh, I know that like me, coming out is a hard process. And some of you might not have done that already. And you know what? That's okay. That is a personal choice. And no one should ever tell you when you should or should not come out. That's a personal choice of yours. Now, there's another side of that coin. Um, and I would agree, and Peter is a perfect example of that, um, which is if someone is a hypocrite, um, is a public official and they're gay, or a religious person and they are gay, and they're speaking against the gay community, oh yeah, they're a safe target. Go after them. Um, and that is still happening in our country. Um, and the best example I could give you, and it's been very uncomfortable for me, um, is that we, uh, one of the strongest voices in our country against LGBT rights is the Catholic Church. And in America, the most conservative part of that and leadership of that is the American Big Conference of Bishops. Uh, and in Philadelphia is one of the most uh, important archdioceses for the Catholic Church internationally because it brings in the bucks um, that the church needs. Uh, and when a new bishop is appointed, uh, archbishop, they are always appointed since the 1800s, eventually bishop slash cardinal. Um, and the one that was appointed 20 years ago in Philadelphia, Archbishop uh, Caput, um, came in and expected that would happen to him. And he was extremely homophobic. Um, and I made it my life's work to make sure he was never promoted to cardinal. He left last year, never being promoted. 
I attacked him publicly profusely. Um, and uh, Pope Francis decided this would not be a very good thing to do. Um, I basically uh, explained that this was a man who was empowering pedophile priests. Not a nice thing to do. Um, our Attorney General of the state of Pennsylvania then decided, uh, gee, uh, is that true, Mark? Yes, it is. Um, maybe I should do an investigation. They investigated 200 priests throughout the Pennsylvania who had molested, or as I'd rather say, raped children, boys and girls. And he, prosecu and he prosecuted them. Um, that man is now running for governor of Pennsylvania and most likely will become governor. Um, so uh, last year, Jason and I went to uh, Rome um, and I got myself a bishop's hat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I eventually will uh, meet up with uh, Cardinal, Cap oh, excuse me, Archbishop uh, Caput, and I'll say, let me present this to you, <laughs> since you'll never get one from the Pope. Um, so you still do things like that, because activism is still important. We haven't left that area here. Um, we are still creating a community. I was lucky enough to realize that LGBT seniors have their own group of problems. So I worked with the Obama administration to create something we didn't have before, doing exactly what we did in 1969. I did this in 2013, which was, what about LGBT seniors who can't afford to have affordable housing? Remember, we're the first out generation. At 71, I'm the first out generation. And if you were out in 1969, any part of the 60s, uh, chances are you, you don't have a pension plan. Chances are you didn't make a good living. Um, you're endangered at this point. So we created a uh, LGBT-friendly uh, senior affordable building with 61 units, 19 million American dollars, um, paid for by your tax dollars. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Um, uh, that was exciting to learn to do something like that. And then all of a sudden a corporation by the name of Comcast came to me and said, gee, why don't you serve on our Joint Diversity Council, which is right below the board of directors. And I said, well, what is that? You know, I don't have time to do. Uh, and the man who did that, who runs the company, David L. Cullen, uh, said, you will be able to make policy for our company. And I said, well, what is that? Um, very simply, and. Uh, uh, it's a company that is in uh, broadcasting, primarily. It's a cable company, um, has streaming services, owns NBC TV station, the one I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, so the key aspect of that was a month after joining the Joint Diversity Council, we went to uh, 30 Rock, Rockefeller Center, um, and I was presented in front of me with every single producer that produced the news, every single uh, presenter, I think you call them, that does the news on air. Um, and they were in a room around a conference desk and they were to listen to me on how they were to change the news so that it would be accepting to LGBT people and help those who were allies or friends and wanted to know more about us to do so. And my opening line was, it's great to be back here at 30 Rock. Uh, 40 years ago when I was here, you took me out in handcuffs. <laughs> I'm glad today I could share with you some of my lived experience. Um, that changed the points where today we have people like Anderson Cooper on the air, R Rachel Maddow, um, MSNBC, which is a major news network in America, uh, has more, I think, gay presenters than it does. Um, what are those other people called? Heterosexuals, I think? <laughs> um, uh, so what that also did for me was teach me a little about you and what you do. And I realized, um, well, Comcast is a big company. It owns Sky here in, in uh, Britain. Um, it has lots of divisions that do lots of, it owns Universal Films. So why don't we have more LGBT films? Why don't we have more LGBT TV stations? Why don't we have more people behind the cameras or in front of the cameras? Gee, what about the boardroom? And what about the employees? How can we reach them? How can we give them a safe place? And that's what each and every one of you are doing today. You're pioneering something that is new. This is just part of an ongoing lesson of learning how to bring diversity and inclusion to all of our society. It's about us growing as a people. 
you're doing that. Welcome to the fight. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm sure everyone will join me in, uh, in thanking you now.